Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our first meeting of 2019. We have Brian Masteratch here, who's going to be giving a presentation of the snakes of Massachusetts. All right, if you want to get started. All right, how are you doing, everybody? Um, well, you're here, Pats are in the playoffs, and the outcome is not a foregone conclusion like it's been in years past if you've been watching them play. So, I, I hate to break everybody's heart. Everyone's already asking, did you bring critters? And I said, well, I didn't bring any because I, I don't have any that you haven't already seen, and you're the choir to which I'm preaching. And they're like, oh, man, I don't care. I still like garter snakes. So, I apologize. If I do it again, I'll bring. Have me do turtles. I can bring you lots of turtles. You probably don't get to see very often. Um, so, we'll just jump into the snakes of Massachusetts and hopefully everyone can uh, see the screen well. So, interesting stuff if you, is figuring out what a snake is. Um, that's not so cut and dry. If we are here talking about reptiles, hopefully here everybody's familiar with the fact that reptiles are vertebrate tetrapods that produce an amniotic egg. When we get more specific than that, we can break them out into lots of different groups, most of which are extinct. But we can get to the archosaurs, the crocodilians, and the dinosaurs. Because uh, remember, birds are not related to dinosaurs. Birds are dinosaurs. And so if you had an omelet today, you ate dinosaur eggs. <laughs> and you can do anything. So, uh, And the other group that's still kicking are the, um, the lepidosaurs part of which are the squamates, and that's where it gets weird after that. What's the difference between a lizard and an amphisbinian and a dibamid and a, a, and a snake? It, it gets really fuzzy and people aren't really sure how those things are related. We just know they're related. Um, except the, the iguanidia clade, you familiar with those? Like they're definitely different than everything else. And all the rest of them are, 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 are some muddy thing that we just can't really understand. So we talked about that. They are vertebrates, tetrapods, which means they got four legs or they are related to things who had four legs. And this is a great thing. I always like to stir it up a little bit because then people will talk about snakes and we go, yeah, snakes, they don't currently have four legs, but they evolve from things that have four legs. And the more we talk about how, yes, life evolved, the better we'll get as a society as we get a little smarter and, and uh, more in tune with reality. Uh, and we, you guys know, this group certainly knows, that we have snakes maybe in this building right now who have some little bitty legs on them. Right? All of the Bowens, uh, they have a little spur right there. It's larger in the males. They seem to use them in mating. And if we were to dissect that out, we would find tiny, tiny little femurs in there. And even in a big, massive snake, it's, it's you know, a toothpick. But it's there. It's what's left. Uh, one of the other neat things about them, um, and this is, where, this is where our talk gets a little blue, um, they have one hole at the back end, right? They have a vent. It drives me crazy when these people who are supposedly knowledgeable call it a cloaca. That's on the inside. That holds the vent. A cloaca is a chamber interior to that. Um, mammals, we're the weird ones, right? We're the only one among that group who have, we have two holes towards the back end. We separate those things out. Um, all right, now, now we're on back to our G-rated portion of the program. Uh, there's a bunch of other things about reptiles with their skulls and their scales. Interestingly, scale is just another silly word, right? A reptile scale. On a, on a snake is very different from a scale on a crocodilian, which is way different than a scale on a fish, and fish have like eight different types of scales. So just that word scale is, is a, it's a bit of a silly thing that we, we like to say. Um, but here's the big deal that separates these from our other favorite group of tetrapods, the amphibians, is that they produce an amniotic egg. They produce that egg that has all sorts of extra embryonic, um, extra embryonic sacs. So there are, there's a yolk sac, there's an, an allantois, which is sort of the, the, the waste sac. There's, and most importantly, the amnion, that little 
that little aquatic environment in which all of those embryos have to develop. So we say, oh, they, they broke away from the, from the water to reproduce. Sure, because they took a little bit with them. And, and the great part is that's really, other than the shell, no different than the egg we all grew out of. And when a, when a woman's pregnant woman's water breaks, that's what's breaking, is that amnion and that amniotic fluid. And then eventually we all know how um, when this little crit is ready, it comes on out and yeah, everyone loves baby things hatching. <laughs> this is pandering, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and that's very different from our other favorite group of critters, right? Because who doesn't love salamanders? Like if you don't like salamanders, we can't be friends. Okay. <laughs> Everybody loves frogs, even people who don't usually like herbs, they like frogs. So the, the amphibians are very different. They have some really different skull characteristics, right? They have you know weird things like two occipital condyles, which makes it hard for them to do this. They have smooth skin. They don't have these dermal coverings. And they lay a very simple egg, um, most of, many of which, most species, but not all, I don't care what your biology teacher told you, have to be laid in the water. We have critters right here, amphibians, who lay their eggs on land and they never touch the water. But I'm sure most of you folks know that. One of the interesting things about these guys, what makes them really different, and I think that's one reason we get fascinated is they're different, is they're ectotherms. So they're ectotherms, and you guys know this because you have to, you're constantly trying to provide them with the right heat, is they get their heat from the outside. Um, hopefully, and I know none of you use that silly word, cold-blooded. Right, because that tegu, when he's sitting under his heat lamp, is as warm as you are, if not warmer. Right, it, that's that's just silly. We try to try to get that out of people's vernacular, but that's really well established. That's a tough one. Um, and not to mention, there's lots of reptiles and fish and creatures we figure out. This this isn't this isn't a zero sum game. They're not sweaty, gross things like us, and they're not completely ectothermic. They're somewhere in the middle like one of our turtles who will be up here hopefully in a, another few months. Uh, for the living, the living reptilia, uh, other than our one little tuatara who's living on the other side of the planet, two species depending on who you listen to, uh, what we're left with today after the huge dynasty we had are the turtles, the crocs, and yes the dinosaurs are still here um, I don't care what anyone tells you, they're just dinosaurs. It makes dinosaurs a little less cool and it doesn't really help your grandmother's parakeet at all. It's, it's still just your grandmother's parakeet, but they are cool. Uh, and what we're here to talk about today, the squamates, specifically the snakes, but that includes a, several other groups, uh, including the lizards. See, here's my take, that's, her, that's her, his glamour shot, I think. You know? um, but some other groups uh, from far-flung places that get lumped in here, the um, things like the Amphisbinians and the Dibamids, uh, lots of cool little weird things that don't really fit anywhere. So these are all the, the arguments that you guys are always trying to make to people, and don't stop, you're doing, you're doing good work trying to tell people that none of them are slimy. Stop it. They don't really dislocate anything, right? They're, they're not really located the way our jaws are. They're very, the skull kinetics in snakes is amazing. Uh, they're so flexible. Uh, they don't chase people. Some guy, heard someone mention about YouTube, actually did a great video on YouTube with uh, water moccasins. And Jesse goes up to one, and, you know, gently, but taps it with his foot and he runs away screaming. And, He's got another camera on the snake, and the snake just sits there. And it, it's really good just showing people, like, stop it. Snakes don't chase anybody. But you guys know that. Um, I think th this is my new pet peeve, is this whole aggressive thing, this aggressive aggressiveness. And self-defense is not aggression, right? If you're defending yourself, that's not aggression. And for all those anti-conservation, anti-science people, well, we didn't make this up. This came from, you know, your hero here. So, listen up, Republicans. Remember that. If a snake bites you, you shouldn't have messed with it. You should have left it alone. So, there's my political 
part of the talk. <laughs> so how many species of snakes live in, in Massachusetts? I think this is a good one even for a crowd like this because if you ask me without me like thinking about like, quick, how many? And I go, uh, and I probably underestimate all the time, even though I know. Uh, and the same thing for the rest of them. And it's probably more than you would guess, particularly if this was a group of people who weren't in a cool hurt club. So, man, we got 14 species that we generally recognize as living here. Isn't that wild? I, even now, I go, what is it, 13? No, it's 14. I, and I just re reviewed this last night. So, and of course, it's our favorite one that everybody's familiar with, right, garter snake. And everyone thinks everything's a garter snake, although they usually think it's a garden snake oh or God. a gardener snake or some other rhyming word. Um, strangely, it's a garter snake. And then, like, they'll ask you, well, what's a garter? And you tell them, they go, why did they call it that? And they go, I don't know. It wasn't me. I think they were distracted. So the really neat, there's a lot of neat things about garter snakes. And, and I like, there's a friend of mine who gets really into garter snakes, and I like it because it reminds me not to, it reminds me to still stay excited about the common things. Because a lot of times the common things, they may not be as common as we think. We think they're common until we go, uh-oh, they're not common anymore. Um, garter snakes are really variable in their patterns and their colors, and there's published research showing how that really does change how these animals behave, that the animals who are, have stripes often behave in one way, and animals without stripes behave in a different way, and we, we don't really know why that may be or how it comes about. The other cool thing is this is an animal that you don't have to go out to the wilds to find. I had someone I knew from Jamaica Plains sending me pictures of snakes in her backyard. What are these? I can't believe they're in my backyard. She was happy about it, thankfully, and there was a pair of garter snakes living under some wood in her backyard. Um, so there's a critter in the backyard with, you know, pretty robust stripes. Um, some of them have even more well-defined stripes. Um, wow. And there's one who's really light, one who's really dark. Saw one once from uh, Cuddy Hunk Island, which had an awful lot of green in it. It was the only one I'd ever seen. Um, and there's one with no stripe at all. Uh, these are from our, our colony we have at the Yagi School. Where trying to work with answering some of these heredity questions about stripes. Um, and then when you get down and look at them, you go, boy, they're terribly, terribly um, complex in these colors. This one seems to have black skin between the scales. Um, ours are a little well-loved, so it's easy to see the skin. They're a little, <laughs> it's a little stretched. Um, it didn't just eat. It's just pudgy. <laughs> um, I have to tell the kids, like, slow down on it. Uh, but you can see there's some that looks white here. This is really like a sky blue. And then, of course, all the variation in the shades on those scales. Um, we talk about keeled scales here, but you guys know what keeled scales are. Uh, and it's, it's cousin, and this is an animal I think maybe we should be starting to pay some attention to. Uh, in the same, it's cogener, an animal in the same genus, the Anophis, the, uh, the ribbon snake. Looks like a skinny garter snake. Looks like the garter snake who, you know, couldn't make the football team. Um, with really, really lovely, well-defined stripes. Um, never with any of that variation that you see in, um, in garter snakes. And, and people will tell you to count the scale rows to make sure. Uh, it's kind of like dichotomous keys. They're written by people who don't need them for people who can't understand them. Um, <laughs> you see enough of them, you know. But always look at the lips on that thing. There's never any patterning on that. If I go back and look at the garter snakes, they got patterning. These guys always have nice white lips. Typically associated with wetlands. Um, I don't think this one was anywhere near a wetland. Uh, so just to goes to show you that animals never read the books. Uh, there's another shot of those lips showing you that they're nice and white. But associated with wetlands, but interestingly, Here's a, a it's cogener garter snake is found just about anywhere backyards forests farms meadows wetlands how do these guys partition the resource right resource partitioning is a really important topic in ecology 
because if you are overlapping too much, just like a business, one's going to put the other out of business unless you somehow divide up those resources somehow. So this might be where you'd expect to find one or somewhere like this, but you could just as well find a garter snake there too. So I'd love to know how they partition those resources. Uh, and this one was out in the Pine Barrens. It was about as, as dry as a bone where, where as it could possibly be. Interestingly, I don't think I find many garter snakes in this area, but I have found quite a few ribbon snakes there. I have no idea why. And if anyone does, I'd love to hear what you know. Um, our other favorite little guy, man, they're all our favorite little guys, are ringneck snakes. Um, really, ours, many subspecies of this snake. And if you head to everywhere but here, the rest of them are mildly venomous. Ours is the only one with no documented that I know of. And this is a great crowd. You might say, hey, I just read about this the other day. I'd love to hear about it after. Um, with no documented venom. One of those things like you don't tell most people because they just freak out. Uh, it's really only a problem if you're a, a plethodonted salamander, <laughs> maybe a slug. Um, but boy, when you get down south and find, th this is an animal that seems to really be associated with eating um, plethodonted salamanders, a little uh, two lines, red back salamanders. You get down south, and at least the ones I found these down south were, seem a bit bigger, but also those salamanders down south, those species are bigger and fast. I mean, they're like lizards when you get some of these southern plethodonids. And you go, wow, now I see why weakening this thing by envenomating it might help out. I mean, it's a more robust and faster animal. Um, that is purely just something I just thought of, so don't take that as fact. Take it as there's lots of cool mysteries, even in the stuff that lives right on the other side of the parking lot. Um, totally neat things, well named. Uh, you can always say as hurt people, either we, we name things very well or we have no imagination whatsoever. Um, but also, this is, a, this is a great animal a lot of people find. Um, this is about as harmless as you can get, even the average person thinks that, but they find them in their garages, under a box, or sometimes even in their basement, and I've never had anyone tell me they, they flee and panic from this, so this might be one of our best uh, Ophidian ambassadors. Oh, and there's the little critter he likes to eat. Um, seems to really be associated with redback salamanders, um, which is a great thing to have as your primary food because this is the most abundant vertebrate in New England. We believe there are more individuals of this thing than anything else living in our forests. And that was just another cute little... But interestingly, this little guy was in Plymouth. Uh, again, dry, sandy, not a lot of redbacks hanging around. It's even a little dry for redbacks, and redbacks are pretty xeric adapted for an amphibian. It's an animal that looks like it, a different genus. Nice. Uh, similar warning colors underneath and neck patterning. The, uh, the red belly snake, uh, lovely um, Latin name there. It's, its species name is Occipito maculatus. And this is your occipit. You can say that next time you're going to smack your kid in the back of the head. And uh, maculatus is, is spotted, refers to the spots. And they typically, most individuals have two spots back there. Like anything, some have one, some have, few have none. Uh, individuals are individuals. Um, this animal, we think, is more of an inver invertebrate feeder. I'm sure it would love a salamander, though, uh, with the bright warning colors. Unfortunately, we can mention this later, this animal this was again in Plymouth, uh, was dead in, a, in a, a dirt bike track. And don't get me started on those, folks. Um, and there was one still kicking, if it could kick. Uh, but note, this critter only has one spot, right? It's just got the one spot back there. So, Occipital maculatum. And it's cogena. Uh, this, this animal has a distinction of probably being our most urban snake. This is the brown snake, sometimes called decay snake. And I believe it's the only snake in North America that has, its name is a double honorarium name. It's named after David Humphrey Storer, Storia, the genus, and uh, decay uh, what was his name, William Decay. Both were Northeastern naturalists in the 19th century. 
Um, really a neat little animal, underappreciated by most, I think, because it's brown. It is a brown snake. Uh, it's it's not really pretty. So you zoom in on them, and like anything else, look at that little smiling at us. But this is a critter. If I wanted to find these, if you said, "Hey, I'll pay you a thousand dollars if you take me out and show me a brown snake," I wouldn't be heading out to the wilds of anywhere. <laughs> I would I would smile like that because I know right where I'd go, and I would head to um, probably this spot in Fall River. Uh, and funny enough, underneath that pallet, there's railroad tracks right here, and under that pallet was something like three red backs and, and, and a brown snake. And as we walked down the tracks, we kept finding more. This is, the tracks are gone, but it's the old railroad grave. In the middle of Fall River, Massachusetts, which this is the wilderness, if you look around, compared to the middle of Fall River, Massachusetts. Um, this was about as urban as you can get. You can't see it because of what's grown in. But we would carefully be flipping all of this junk, um, and really carefully because there are dangers associated with urban herbivores. <coughs> so you can see the hypodermic needle, the little free basin set up here, someone's stash there. Um, you don't want to grab that when you're reaching for a snake. I had no idea if there was an exposed needle there or not. I wasn't getting close enough. But it's a great little snake, at least they always look the same. They're always brown with a little bit of that checkering pattern. Um, some people, kids getting into herping, will, oh, is it a little garter snake or, no, nope, it's a little, a, a little decay snake. So even those kids in the middle of the city, and, and I'll take this time to say, good work to Fall River. They built a lovely trail along a, a river there, and there's a lot of, urban residents now getting out there and I've seen them taking pictures of dragonflies and fishing and taking pictures of bullfrogs and stuff and that's awesome. Uh, just a thought, this might be why the brown snakes are so um, abundant there. We found an awful lot in these urban areas, an awful lot of these little Sapaea nemoralis snails, uh, these little garden snails. These are an introduced species too from Europe. Um, Kind of nice if they're help to, helping to bolster um, an underappreciated little herb of ours. And, and probably one of the hardest things to find. Yeah. This is one we should have on our, our concern list, too. Um, I don't know if they're rare. I don't know if anyone knows if they're rare, which is why we should be concerned, because these are needles in haystacks. So this is the green snake. There are two in this genus, Ophiodres. Um, ours up here is a smooth green snake. It has smooth scales. Down south is a rough green snake uh, with keeled scales. But this is an animal which seems to feed on invertebrates well, we think. Uh, orthopterans, things like crickets and grasshoppers and probably caterpillars and other stuff. And they have no problem taking to low vegetation, shrubs, uh, tall grasses. And uh, this is the kind of place where you might find them. Find a green snake in that. And then when you find one, go buy a lottery ticket or something. Something else that you have no chance of actually succeeding at. Uh, really, really cool little snakes. I think I've only found like, I don't know, five ever. And this is what I do for fun. Um, but all three of these um, green snakes and the two storer species, the uh, brown snake and the ringneck, these are, we think, like to eat invertebrates. So these are gardeners' friends. They're small creatures. A lot of the field guides will tell you they get to a foot long. You find a, a red belly snake a foot long, boy, that's, that's, a, that's a big red belly snake. Uh, maybe I found some brown snakes almost that big. But those are great gardeners' friends. They like to eat the things that might be eating your plants. Um, if you got ring necks around your house, you'd like to have red backed salamanders around your house because they like to eat termites. That's their favorite foods. So maybe you move the red backs away. I mean, the ring necks away. Keep the. Um, the other friend of the agriculturalist, uh, which is funny given its name, uh, this is a group who knows how milk snakes got their name, right? How farmers used to think they were drinking the milk from the cow's udders at night. And 
then they wonder why we goof on them. Uh, <laughs> clearly, that was silly. Dairy barns were lovely places to find rodents in shelter. Boy, it would be a great place to live if you were a snake who didn't mind eating rodents. Um, and this is our one of the many milk snakes of North America. This is our one native. Uh, they, some individuals are more colorful than others. I, I think the littler ones are often more colorful. This animal was just a little guy, maybe a year old. And it was much, much more red than I often find it. Uh, but another animal that we don't find all that much, and is that because we don't have the number of livestock facilities anymore? You know, with the number that we used to have, was that an artificially inflated number ecologically? And now as we have less agriculture, they're coming back down to a different level. I won't say a natural level, because the landscape here certainly isn't natural. And someday we can have a whole talk about what that even means. But uh, could that be part of it? And now that there, we have fewer livestock facilities, we have fewer little um, milk snake food factories. But again, that's all purely just a, a silly guess. Um, and if you were a different crowd, this is where I point out to you to look for that little Y-like pattern that's there on most milk snakes. I think I found one or two that it wasn't really distinct. But to the average person, that would be a great field mark for him. And if we're gonna have the favorite snake category, I mean, this might be the guy who wins. Um, I don't know, I just have a hard time picking. They're almost everyone's favorite is a hognose snake. There's several in North America, and this is ours, the eastern hognose, which is, if it ain't the biggest, it's got to be one of the biggest. And just about the neatest snake, this is an animal that lives um, in association with sandy soils, where it can use that nose to the best of its ability to try to root out those little creatures it's seeking. And it's a little easier for that to do in a looser, sandier soil than it is in more typical organic soils, siltier soils. And it's a great illustration of why a naturalist really can't know about just one thing, right? You can't know about just snakes. If you want to really know as much as you can about snakes, you've got to learn a little bit about plants and a little bit about soil and a little bit about mammals and insects and water and everything else. So this is a typical pine barren forest where I might expect to find a hognose snake or green snakes, uh, somewhere like Miles Standish State Forest. And that upturned nose is what they're using to dig through there and root out their favorite little prey. Amphibians, often toads, and often fowler's toads, which are the toads that we tend to associate with those sandier habitats as well but I've, happily, I've seen them happily attack a, a green frog or anything else. I've seen them hanging out, prowling the edges of ponds in the water looking for frogs. That one, that was kind of a fun, and that was a big animal and almost no pattern to it. it was pretty cool. I think his picture might be in here. Um, they are a bit variable in their patterns, um, and they're, they're the great thespians, right? The great actors of, of our herptofauna, and everybody knows and, and this was kind of interesting that this animal actually did it um, because this uh, animal was at a uh, Boy Scout camp in Plymouth where I was telling someone earlier, every summer the kids would find hognose snakes and they'd bring one to the nature area and for the week or four days or whatever, every kid would come and bring a toad every day and the snake probably would eat more <laughs> that week than it ate the rest of its life. And they, you catch a hognose snake there and they're happy. They, they don't mind, they never do their thing. Um, and we happen to be there with a few folks from Western Mass who don't get to see these very often. I said, well, come down, we'll, we could probably find one. We found three, and these, two of the three did the whole um, act. It's so convincingly that we're staying there with, it was like a vet and three herpetologists and we're going, I'm not sure this animal's okay. And, and we, we like we like try to wash the sand out of its mouth and put it back under its cover object. And we checked it before we left and it was gone, it was fine. They're just that good. Um, and you've seen how they go through, and, and I, I really like to talk to people about this, to non-stick people 
thing because I remember my aunt when I was little, she had a hog nose in her yard and it did its whole thing. She went, oh, Venus thinks she dropped a big rock on it. And I was like, what? Auntie Rosemary. I know second too. I was like six or something. So um, they do the whole thing and then they convulse. And the great part is, if you've never seen this, it's also an olfactory experience. Their vent is wide open and they are smearing a musky like <laughs> substance that people say it smells like rotting meat. I'm not sure it does, but it definitely is not lovely. Um, and they smear it on themselves, and there's parts of it here, you can see it, you know, that chalky, I'd rather be bitten a hundred times and get that on me. Um, and then it sits there and plays dead. You can see his vent is wide open, his mouth is open, and his tongue is hanging out. His tongue literally hangs out. If you flip it, if you haven't seen this, you've got to make it your, your mission this summer to go see it. Flip, yeah, they flip right back over. You can't keep them on their on their um, ventral side, they just keep flipping. Um, and if you just sit back and wait, eventually they'll peek at you. <laughs> and so you, you, you know, they can't do this, because you know, they don't have their movable eyelids, but they'll turn their head, and, and if you're still there, they, um, and if you're gone, they'll, if you step back far enough, then they'll slowly kind of turn over and, and, and head out. But, they're mildly venomous. There's what? They're mildly venomous. They're also mildly venomous, and that's another thing I don't tell a lot of people. I mean, if you're a toad, it's a big deal. If you're not, it's... Yeah, if the, who knows? I mean, has anyone ever actually been bit by any of the cardinals? Yeah. I, I've, and you can see how variable they can be. Some are awfully yellow. Um, some are just sort of ground, gray and brown. Uh, we found some with no pattern at all. Um, Really neat animals. These were these were two of the ones that like really made us think they were dead. They were that good. Um, oh, yeah, here's the animal, no pattern at all. That was a terrible cell phone picture, but it was such a unique animal I had to keep it. Um, so he was and he was a big one. This was one that was in the water, looking for frogs. We think, and maybe because he was just so big, he could take on most bullfrogs. He he was a he was a lunker. Um, I've always found the babies looking about the same. I've no, never found a yellow baby or a paddleless baby. I don't know if anyone here has ever found a baby that looks different than that. But every baby I've ever found is sort of that gray with dark blotch patterns. And then, you know, they just smile at you when they, when they really hate you, you know? We should all, this is a lesson from a hog nose. If you're dealing with someone who's really driving you nuts, just smile at them. And then fight. Yeah. <laughs> Well, then, pretend to bite them. Play dead on yourself. Um, and probably, I, I think, one of the most fascinating snakes that we have, and, and maybe it's because when I was little, of course, I liked everything that was giant. Now I, I think I'm more fascinated by the teeny things. Not that this animal is particularly teeny, but it sort of has a teeny way of life. Um, if you didn't know, we do have worm snakes, Carphophis, in Massachusetts. And they're only like in, I don't know, four sites in Western Mass. And there are also sandy sites like this, uh, where the animal can sort of move through. They, this animal looks wet, it's not. It's just so incredibly smooth that it's shiny. Whether that's the way they, their scales grow, or it's a combination of their scale development and the way that they're always slithering through sand, they're always getting polished. Um, we think that they're eating a lot of insect larvae in the wild, things like uh, Ant larvae, maybe beetle grub larvae. I don't think we have, we have no idea what they're doing in Massachusetts. There's one guy I know of who's been trying to work on these, but in something like 14 years, he, he was able to find six, uh, and he would he had pit tags in him, uh, and he actually had a, a pit tag reader that looked like a uh, metal detector, so he could follow him, and he would find if if this snake, if it was under this cover object it would be there for a few days and then it would move to this cover object and then it would move to that cover object in a few days and then it would disappear and the next time it showed up it would come to this cover object and then in a few days it would move to that cover and it would go the same route um, where do they go when it gets too hot they disappear where do they go when it gets too cold they disappear where do they go um, we know something about them down south where people find them raking their leaves and that may or may not be true up here at the edge of their range. 
Um, no idea. They might be doing things a bit differently up here. Um, one of the fun things about them, they're called the worm snake because, boy, they off, they do look like worms. It looks like you have a big, um, vibrant and active worm, unless you notice the little eyes and the, the, the sort of vertebrate-like mouth, you might just assume it's a worm and it zooms away. Uh, they do have bright pink bellies. Their tails are actually a hard little spike. And if you're holding one, it's going to be poking you with that. And it seems it's not so much, it may be he's trying to poke me and hurt me, so I'll drop him. But when you put them down, they also seem to um, use that into the ground and, and push themselves. So whether they're trying to push themselves into the, the loose soil or just launch themselves away. See, that, that was sand, but that was sand on top of asphalt because we knew the little bugger would, would zoom away. It was right behind a building at UMass where we took those pictures. Um, sorry, I Steve Irwin did. Um, didn't want him to get away because I didn't know when I'd get another one. Um, so that tail seems to be very important in its locomotion, at least when it is frightened. Um, and yeah, there it is, that spiky little tail that is, is very different um, than, a, say, a garter snake tail. It's not sharp like a thorn, but it's pointy enough, like, say, a sharp pencil. That'll it'll make you want You can see there, he's got it in the sand. He's got it. He's probably hit the asphalt yeah, now. Sure. And he's, yeah, he's ready to use that like an anchor point. So. It looks like an earthworm. It does. It does. And I try to tell people and, that I know in Plymouth, say, so you got to look for this. And I tell them that because we know it's really sandy over here and all out there, but every worm snake in Massachusetts that we know of is found here. In the very southern Connecticut Valley area over here, why are there none over there? Um, I hear tell of records from Rhode Island, and I haven't got down there to talk to uh, their brandy new state herpetologist. Hey, you really have records from Rhode Island? Um, but there seem to have been two paths for organisms coming back here after the glaciers, and they came the coast, and they came up the Connecticut River, and some seem to go one and not the other. And this seems to be that case. Hognose you can find in both places, the Connecticut River Valley and southeastern Mass, and smattering in other places. But worm snakes just went to that river and stopped. So getting away from the dry, sandy things, we get out to the water, the wet spots, and we were kind of there already with ribbon snakes. But even flat out in the absolute open water, not just marshes, uh, boy, I think this guy's one of my favorite snakes, too. I just can't pick. Um, and everybody here knows that that's our northern water snake. And this is the map where you try to show people the northernmost documented location for water moccasins or cottonmouths, whatever you like to call it, a histodon specific or whatever it is, is the Great Dismal Swamp in Virginia. That's the Great Dismal Swamp in Virginia. Isn't that a great name? I just want to go there and get the name. Yeah. Um, I want a t-shirt that says something about Great Dismal Swamp. <laughs> that's really far from here. That, that's quite a drive. Um, we don't have water moccasins. You guys know that. But boy, it's something you really, really got to tell the public. Like, and just stop it. If you're not a frog or a shiner or a little sunfish, you have nothing to fear. And even if we did have water moccasins, you have nothing to fear. However, we all know, we all know how cranky these critters are, oh, yeah. but it's also our job to tell them that self-defense is not the same thing as aggression, right? You know how do you, you avoid this? You don't pick it up. Uh, I picked him up and I got bitten. And I said, let's take a picture of that. Um, and I'm sure everyone here knows the interesting story about the anticoagulant in their saliva. It, it's yeah, it does nothing to me and you. If you're a frog, yeah, it might weaken you enough to make you a little easier to, to uh, overpower. Imagine overpowering a frog that was as big as you. I mean, that, that'd be a heck of a wrestling. I'm not sure I could take a, a, a me-sized bullfrog in, in two out of three falls. So anything I could do to weaken that thing, yeah, it's probably quite helpful. And as good as these things are in the water, 
they're nowhere near as good as a shiner or a little pumpkin seed. You know, that thing will swim away much faster. They've got to weaken them. Um, so just leave them alone, they won't bite you. Or pick them up and get bitten and go, okay, that, that wasn't so bad. Um, and they're, they're absolutely spectacular, as you know, when they're young. As they get older, they get quite dark, and they lose that, that beautiful dorsal coloring, but their bellies stay pretty nice. Uh, for most of their lives. Uh, we do have a captive one and we try to take it to events. I always want to take that snake to say, see, it's not a water moccasin. I wouldn't take a water moccasin to an event. Um, great place to find them is along these sort of stone walls, bridge abutments, or uh, this was actually a... I know where that was taken. <laughs> Place in Middleborough? Yep, yep, all of Mills Park. Yep. Isn't that awesome? Yep, they're always there. Yep. And you can park here, and they're right there where that green fence is. And there can be people everywhere, and they yep. don't care. Yep. You also know that I'm from that part of the state. Good <laughs> detective work. And this one was also there, and you can see that's just what they want to do. They just want to sit in the sun like every other reptile, and if you leave them alone, they'll leave you alone. But again, you guys know that. And I threw this guy in there. This was a really cool one, again, from Plymouth. Um, and we found more than what I did, but I've gotten pictures from people with snakes like this, and you gotta go, oh, you gotta look at it for a second, and you go, oh, that's an aneurythristic, no red, northern water snake. And I don't remember this in the first one that I saw pictures of, but this one had blue eyes, which I didn't notice until I looked at the photographs. And he's got some injuries there. It was just a, it was a, a big brush breaker truck coming in to do a demonstration about forest fire stuff for the kids. And it, I think it got just his tail. So once I, I kind of moved him out of the way, and hopefully he's OK. Because boy, that's an awfully cool animal. Uh, I'd love to find a big you know, three foot one with blue eyes out there someday. So he, and this was his belly. Look at that, no red, just black and white. Wow, wow. So that's kind of wild. It was that close to keep them. <laughs> um, and man, I just, I don't know why I love black racers. They're just, I, I, I don't know, it might be their crankiness. <laughs> but this is an animal that acts so different from all the rest of our snakes. They have them downstairs, actually. Oh, they do. Um, those absolutely um, smooth scales, and their name is very good. They are all black, dorsally, and they race. Every, almost every one I've had to catch, I have to run after and dive on. And, and it's not to be dramatic, it's just they're fast. Um, they, and they'll get up in a, a low brush. Uh, we've kind of chased them up little pine trees and catch them a little easier that way. And we all know that they're terribly, terribly cranky creatures too. Um, but it's kind of hard to see in this slide. This animal was sort of keeping an eye on me. And you notice his head is up. These are very visual animals. These are visual predators. They're diurnal snakes, they're active in the day, and they're, they're hunting using their eyes a lot. Uh, not that they're not using their, their, um, their tongue and their Jacobson's organ, uh, but they're very visually based. And you will see them moving around with their heads up, looking around um, like uh, some sort of mythical serpent or that, that uh, BBC video from the Galapagos with the, uh, with the yep. Uh, other racers chasing the little iguanas. Um, not that necessarily they were related, but convergently evolved. That these are sight, the, the serpent versions of a sight hound. Um, and this animal was defensively had his head up and was watching me after I, you know, tormented it to the point where I'm just holding it back to take pictures, and then finally I feel badly and I let the animal go along its way. Um, and, and they are the first ones. And you can see why people might, who, I don't know how you would corner one accidentally. They're just so hard to get a hold of. But they, they will rear right up. They will do their best to scare you away. And even though they're, they're big snakes, their bite is, you know, it's like any other, most of the other snakes around here. It's just a little pinch. And there he is. He's, he's ready to, uh, great, great name. Um, the, their species name is Constrictor. And, and really, it's not much of a constrictor. Right? A lot of our snakes are overpowerers. 
And the lovely thing, and what you never learn from the, e the Discovery Channel or the Learning Channel, whatever those things pretend to be, or even the BBC, which does a wonderful job, is when most predators are eating their prey, it's alive when they're eating it, right? Some of the few animals who don't do that are the venomous snakes that we think are so terrible. Um, so most of these snakes, they're overpowering an animal and swallowing it. It's alive when it reaches that stomach. Um, and you can see, look at how little those teeth are. I mean, you probably can't even see them if you're toward the back. They're so little. But they will use them. Uh, and I swear if you catch one, you always catch it by the towards the back. Cause you're, it's, and I swear when you stand up, if you're not careful, I, I know they strike at my face on purpose. <laughs> yeah. um, and sometimes that's how I know it's a racer. Is not only is it so fast, but I grabbed it before I can even you know, stand up, I'm already being bitten. Oh yeah, that's a diagnostic key right there. It's a racer. <laughs> um, but they're just great snakes. Um, and that was a racer in the beginning. And you put it again because, oh, here's a baby. And this is what they look like. When oh, they're that's so they cute. look very, very different. Um, unfortunately, most people don't know this because when's the last time you've seen a black racer? Two years ago. Yeah. So this is an animal that I on the unofficial, officially not real watch list. Like biologists are paying attention to this animal now because we're getting concerned about it. There's um, one site that I know where I have a decent chance of maybe two, and they're not far from each other, a decent chance of, of finding these guys. Um, and it's just, it's, it's a bit concerning. And nobody knows why. The great thing is out of the A, they have the same personality. <laughs> they, just, they just hate you. Uh, and that's okay. But even, and this animal is a, it's not quite a hatchling, it's a little older. But notice, and I know baby things have big eyes. It's just ontogenetically, that's true of a lot of vertebrates. But the eyes on these snakes, they're big compared to other, our other snakes. They're visual hunters, they're visual predators which makes them really cool. So our other um, big black snake that we have is pretty rare and not only climbs into low brush, but climbs up in the tree canopies too. Um, this animal was, well, it was on its way down, but it was, I don't know, 30 feet high when we were first seeing it. So this is our mythical black rat snake. Uh, which there's a, a bit of a controversy about. I think is it truly a native population, isn't it? I, I'm not sure how it could be. I think it'd be really hard for such a southern creature to survive up here if it didn't have a genetic uh, evolutionary history to do so. This is just not rat snake habitat. It's just like today. Go outside. Uh, that'll prove it to you. Um, they spend a good part of their spring and early summer here up in the canopy because there's tons of food up there in the spring um, and it's one of it's our only snake who can do it and they go up there um, for a particular reason to find that food uh, and can you see them hmm. uh, I'm not very good at this uh, can you see them now and this is just so you can have an idea of how high up this snake was and now you might be able to see him. Oh, yeah. And now you can probably see him. Yeah. Oops. So they pull it all down. He's right wrapped around here. And this was a good size adult. I never got a handle on him because he was really high up in the tree. But this was, this was him sitting up there in the, the summer, sunning and probably getting ready to head out for the day to find his next um, his next meal. And it was very funny, that tree is in the middle of a picnic area and you can see, you keep looking down. There's people still, we had our tripod set up and he kept, he, he was ready to come down, it was getting close to noon and eventually that picture, he did come down and he went across a branch into another tree. But I think he wanted to come down to the ground and move along, which is all the better because it's, it's in a park and I didn't want him to get run over. But I just made that up. I really didn't want to. Um, but this is our only snake. There are other snakes who can do this. This is our only snake who can do this. Climb straight up the trunk of a tree. We have uh, a black rat snake. We've got a 
to have one just out of the pet trade. And we wanted an actual black one that looked like the native ones. And when we're at a, a fair doing this sort of thing at a fair, we bring live critters. We go, okay, you want to see his trick? And you can do this. And if you if you hold this animal, you can feel the, the corners on their on their belly, on their belly plates, on their ventral scales, and they're kind of shaped like a loaf of bread. And we see, that seems to be how they get in there and grip on all these fissures in these, this tree bark. And they can get up into these trees. Um, and often in the early, in the spring and early summer, because there's plenty of food up there in, oh, in, in the, uh, in, in bird's nests. And maybe the birds themselves, if it's a, a little bird like this, um, there's food up there. So they head up. After a while though, the birds are done nesting and the little ones leave the nest and the snakes come back down and eventually act more like what we think a snake around here acts like. These animals seem to be restricted though to a very particular habitat structure which we'll, we'll mention again in a minute. We have three snakes who desperately need that. But that's kind of wild. I mean I have friends who are arborists who work up in trees all the time and they have no idea that we have fairly large snakes who live up in the tree canopy 30, 40, 50, 60 feet off the ground or more. Um, and I said, don't worry, you will not see them. This is uh, one of the rarest creatures we have in the state. Um, you, if you see one, go buy a lottery ticket. And this is what they look like when they come out, when they hatch. They look totally different as well. So black racers, and black rat snakes, even though these are, these are two different lineages of snakes, they do come out looking very similarly. Probably because when you're this little, uh, camouflage is your best bet, as opposed to speed or intimidation. But this is an animal that seems to be restricted to this sort of habitat. It has to have this sort of structure somewhere around its, its, uh, its preferred forest. This is a southern creature it's probably not really good at this type of weather and it seems to be associated with these deep fissure hibernacular just like um, the rattlesnakes of which you're quite aware um, where we find this we find other snakes using these as well particularly racers but um, where I know I go find racers right now is in Plymouth there's nothing like this in Plymouth that I know of deep um, deep rock structure with deep fissures that go down below the frost line, we think. Um, I don't know if we've ever been able to visualize or track where they were in three-dimensional space. I think we assume that they're going down below the frost line. And, uh, so that's terribly important up here. Um, and it's terribly important to another couple of snakes like this one. They go, I don't see a snake there. Yeah, I didn't see it at first either. Um, like that one. Uh, one of our only two venomous snakes here, and you guys know uh, we only have two truly venomous snakes, medically venomous, right, where it's really going to matter if it bites you. Um, I can't imagine even one of those venomous ringnecks down south that really bothers anybody. But if one of these bites you, you probably want to go get that looked at. Um, so that's our little northern copperhead feisty little critters, uh, some of them when you find them, and this is all they want to do is sit under the trees when they're warm and sit out in the rocks when they're feeling chilly and, and have a couple of, uh, couple of prey items. In fact, here, here's a good story. I love that you're taping this. Um, that was facetiousness. I was going to head out and try to find, um, on this day, um, spiny softshell turtles in the Connecticut River. So I had on my shorts and my Teva sandals, and I was heading out, and I had bumped, it, bumped into Tom Tining, some of you may know from Western Mass, who does a lot of work. He's like, oh, come on, I'm going to see Copperheads. He's like, oh, okay, I'll go with you. And now, now they're making fun of me because I'm wearing sandals and go for venomous snakes. I'm like, excuse me, I was supposed to be in the water today. Um, so I'm sure I, I won't live that down. Um, and if you leave them alone, that's what they'll do. Uh, they'll sit there and quietly... Um, go about their lives. These animals, this population is in a, a rather, I'm told, I've never been here before, a rather um, well-loved 
sort of public park kind of area, state park, uh, I'm not sure who owns it. Um, that animal was about, um, I don't know, 20 feet off a trail, and the one in the trees that you couldn't really see was, was eight feet off a trail. Um, and they've had some, but thankfully not a lot of, of um, I don't know, what would you call it? Would you call it poaching when these you know, dirt bags just kill the snake for no reason? I guess I would. Um, I'd call it murder. Yeah, sure. So um, thankfully very little of that. And I think because most people are staying on the trails and the trails are in really shady areas and there's plenty of sunny rocky areas. So they, they, they don't seem to cross paths very much. So that was kind of nice to know that they uh, seem to be existing. And everyone knows whose calling card that is. Mm -hmm. And that's our most considerate snake, right? Because it's telling you, hey, I'm over here. I'd rather not deal with you today. Please leave me alone. I mean, how much more do you want <laughs> from an animal? I mean, it, it's this is like, you know, the dog was barking and growling at me, and then when I tried to pet it, it bit me. Well, it was trying to tell you it doesn't like you, you know? Um, so our other, our other pit viper, and, and going into pit viper biology for you guys is a bit of a um, redundancy, but again, really variable snakes from really dark critters to really yellow critters. Um, and are just absolutely important for our environment. I'm not sure that they control the rodent population, but there have been some papers uh, published that discuss the number of deer ticks that they each individual snake removes from the environment every year. I mean, you could probably say the same thing about red-tailed hawks and coyotes and every other predator that likes to eat white-footed mice. But they're definitely really cool animals that don't bother us if we leave them alone. Um, they, they seem to like to hang out together. This, these two venomous snakes are also terrifically tied to those deep rocky outcrops because they're southern creatures. We're, we're almost at the edge of the timber rattlesnakes range. We seem to be at the edge of the copperheads range. And um, rat snakes do get up into Canada, but farther west of here, and, and like Ontario, which is like their Miami. Um, <laughs> And, and this is where they like to live, particularly being mammal specialists. There's squirrels, there's chipmunks, there's mice. If they're towards the edge in a more shrubby area, there might be some cottontails. Uh, and they still need these same deep fissures um, where they can deal with the winter, the winter cold. And boy, they're eating those things which actually do carry disease, which actually do eat our food, which actually can have an effect on our health. And why in, in God's name would we like to save them? Well, you can't tell the average person, well, because they're cool, because they were here first, because they're not bothering you, like don't be a jerk. None of that will, will um, make sense to some of these people. But there's plenty of reasons, um, just a few of which, of how these venoms, and remember venoms are these concoctions of a lot of different proteins that are really active in, in the physiology of the prey, and particularly timber rattlesnakes whose prey is mammals, and we're mammals, we're finding all sorts of potential uses, and not all of them will pan out, but potential uses for these proteins for our own health and well-being and medical care. And particularly, one of these was for a thrombolytic, right? A clot buster. You know, that's like a big problem in America where we all have a little too much of this and we have to deal with heart issues and thrombolytics are terribly important. Um, and some of them have been, they're trying to attack different sorts of cancer cells with some of these proteins. Um, so lots of reasons to keep any venomous creature around. They are amazing libraries. They are chemistry labs that have been running for millions upon millions of years. Um, and we've had one person die that I know, maybe you guys know of more, in 400 years of, of European, uh, European colonization in Massachusetts. And when you go back and read about this person, the treatment probably had almost if not more to do with, the, with, I think it was a her, demise than the rattlesnake fight. I'm sure the rattlesnake bite was unpleasant, um, but the things they did uh, to medicate her were 
also quite unpleasant. So that's, that seems uh, a little silly that we've eradicated most of these populations because just since 2008 to 15, and I do have a citation down there, unfortunately you can't read it. So, you know, almost 600 people were killed by horses and cattle. Uh, you know, 230 killed by dogs. Uh, 112 killed by all venomous reptiles, spiders, sharks, jellyfish, and scorpions combined. But, you know, if you went around, you know, shooting German shepherds, people would freak out. You know, and I love Jimmy Shepherds, but it's the first dog I thought of. I mean, people would lose their minds. Or if you, you know, you said anything bad about, you know, my friend Flicker out there, I mean, they would just go nuts. And it's like, well, statistically, they're terribly, terribly, terribly more dangerous. But since when have facts ever, ever gotten anyone's attention? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and we all know the worst part about living in New England, right? Yeah. And the worst part is, about living here is, of course, that there are no lizards. Um, and I and I get really I get uh oh this there we go all right there are no lizards. Um, and I get really mad. Like sometimes I have to stop like looking at say a reptiles magazine. It's like oh how I breed this. Well, step one what they don't tell you is live in Miami. <laughs> and that's a big offense. Yeah, shut up. Um, or. You know, on Instagram, you see, oh, we went herping on New Year's Day, and we caught this, 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 and it's like, ugh. I have a, a student who now, she lives in Phoenix or something, and that's what she texted me. Oh, we have like 40 species of lizards around here. <laughs> Short off, never contact me again. So, um, uh oh, I don't think I want to go far. Oh, we got, we got through it. It's like the scratch DVD I got from Netflix. So we do have this sort of one-ish, kind of, not really, lizard in Massachusetts. You're going, what? No, we don't. This is its range map. I don't know if the rest will come up. And it's, you know, nature, sir, they know what they're doing. And I'm not sure if that's running right on the mass line or not really, because this is our one New England lizard. We know it's in New England. Um, there are two Massachusetts records. There are air quotes around that records. Um, one from Barry, Mass, which is out near the Quabbin, sort of a woodsy area, and one from New Bedford, Mass, which in no way seems plausible. Uh, however, those are the, the reports. We should call them reports, not records. Um, there is no specimen for either one of these. And this gets down to the why Natural History Museums reference collections, not the really pretty dioramas, but the lots of catalog things on jars. This is one reason why they're terribly, terribly important. If there was a, an actual specimen someone collected from either of these sites, this would absolutely be listed as a Massachusetts um, native critter, but there isn't. Um, and that critter is, if we can keep moving forward, we might not. It's the revenge of Macintosh on my IBM. Computer. Uh oh. I'll let, I'll let a Mac person look at this. So, uh, the five line skink is known from Connecticut, New York, and Vermont. Now, you figure Western Mass is in the middle there, but there is no record of one from Western Mass. And I want to say there's maybe one population extent in Vermont. Thankfully, the land has been protected. There are skinks and I believe timber rattlesnakes on that uh, mountain. Uh, the skinks up here are also associated with deep rocky fissure habitat sites. Uh, because again, this is a southern creature getting up at the northern end of its range. It does not like winter whatsoever. We can go that way if you like. So there's, there's a critter. Um, with that, I don't know how to start PowerPoint. Let's see. Um, I don't know Max, but I'll try this. See if it likes it. If it gives me the digital finger. Um, so there's there's um, probably an adult female. They they tend to still have the the five lines. Um, hey, we seem to be rolling. Um, they will keep some of the blue tail, but usually the juveniles have the blue tail. They have this self-autonomous uh, tail that will drop off defensively if a predator grabs it. 
it'll, it'll break off that tail and a new, not quite as shiny one will grow back, but that little wiggly tail will often keep the predator, um, keep the predator entertained. So there we are, there's our two dubious accounts and there's just a cute five no, line skink. So cute. Um, all of these skinks are southern five line skinks. This is a different species. Um, in expectatus, uh, you can't really tell without like doing scale counts. Um, see, that one was actually in Florida. Um, but that bright blue tail attracts the predator's attention to where you want to get hit if you have to. Um, adult males get a little bigger, they'll develop a red head and they'll lose a lot of that, that lined coloration, so it'll kind of just turn gray and drab. So if you find, ever find a lizard in Massachusetts, you do what it takes <laughs> to get a hold of that thing. I mean, a picture is okay. We can work with a picture, but the actual critter would be better. So, how are snakes doing? Uh, something that's weird didn't come up there. So, our snakes are doing meh. Most, well, not most of them, but almost half of them have some sort of protection in Massachusetts. Our two vipers and the black rat snake are listed as endangered. For some god unknown reason, the worm snake is only protected as threatened. Same protection, though. Yeah, and it's probably just less of a fight. Um, there's some concern, and you know, watching is not at all an official category. It's not protected, but people are starting to pay attention to um, black racers. And if I added it, um, people are. Um, we have the hognose snake in this very strange, um, neither fish nor fowl situation, where you can't have one. A kid can't pick one up and take one home legally, but you can put a housing development on top. Yep. And, and I don't think anyone should bring them home, leave them out there, let them make baby hognose snakes. However, don't put housing developments on them either. I, it baffles me that this is not protected as at least a species of special concern. Um, and that's where, you know, you have to, people like you have to rise up, and we'll talk about that later against some of these groups. Like, um, but unfortunately, this is our one. This is our one tax on where the courts don't often support this. I mean, people get caught red-handed by by environmental police officers with either poaching these animals. And, and why anyone's trying to take a timber rattlesnake is beyond me. Um, black rat snakes are in the pet trade like crazy. Why you have to poach them? but they'll take these animals or kill them on purpose because they know it's a rattlesnake and they kill it on purpose. And they go to court and the court says, I'm not gonna find a guy, I'm not gonna punish someone for killing a rattlesnake. I, I, I haven't quite figured out who to complain to about that. Like, this judge needs to do his or her job, right? But um, when I do, I'll let you know. Um, so why are they in trouble and what can we do? Well, these might be turtle eggs, but the same thing happens. Uh, we subsidize, and we as in the general populace, we subsidize nest predators. You've heard about this with turtles, I'm sure, because we leave out trash, and God, those people will leave pet food out on purpose. We have unnaturally um, dense meso-predator populations, um, and some people do this on purpose to bring those meso-predators because Cute little raccoons and foxes and coyotes come hang out at their house. And this is exactly the, the group of critters who wants to eat reptile eggs. They've done it for millions of years. The problem now is as the food source gets scarcer, the predator population does not drop in response because they're being subsidized by food. So they stay high and these critters never get a chance to get a few cohorts of eggs out. Um, of course, this, this was in the wild in Attleboro. This is in a backyard pond. Um, we have lots of critters out there. Um, are those sliders really competing with that painted turtle? I don't know, but I'm sure there are folks here who can tell you all about the disease transmission potential of an animal that comes out of, and it might be a wrong crowd, but I am not a fan of pet stores. They come out of filthy, 
half-dead pet stores, and they're released eventually when people realize, as you know, these animals take a lot of work to take care of and maintain properly, and they go, I don't want to do this anymore, or I'm sick of it now, the novelty wore off, and they let it go. Um, what sort of diseases are we transmitting to our wild critters? And probably the worst, not just for herbs, but for everything. Plants, animals, all sorts of wild organisms, habitat destruction, habitat destruction, habitat destruction. Um, this is uh, what's happening all over, right? If we all know that if this was a great place for that black racer to hunt, it ain't gonna be probably soon. Uh, and hopefully the people who move in will not be the kind of people who wanna kill snakes on site. You know, if that half an acre was box turtle habitat, boy, that took a lot of its home range out. Um, even worse is when you see this going on, you go, oh, now this place wasn't going to be a housing development road, but here's a road, and we know what happens with roads, and here's my disclaimer for those of you who get queasy, avert your eyes, right? We often think of this with, with um, turtles, but it happens to snakes too, and I think it happens more with snakes, it's just the crows clean it up faster. Right. Is snakes are getting out there and getting warm. You go, well, it's a garter snake. This was a black racer. You know, somewhere I got pictures of a milk snake squished in a road. I mean, it's just roads. Roads are, are herb killing machines. Um, they're just hideous. So let's get to the positive part. What can you do? Hey, you can have a little while if you got any property at all. Even if you have a normal property with a, a small little backyard, half the size of this room. You could have some wild space. This was actually in a park, but this was all native species. There was cardinal flower, verbane. Um, there was um, blue lobelia in there. There's all kind of amphibians who are going to be in this. You know, it, it's, if you didn't know, those are sort of wet species. That's a bit of a swale. You know, you make habitat for frogs. You just made a, a snake feeder. Um, so if you can keep a little wildness that way. If you have a little more property, boy, a little wildness like this, a little area, we often think cutting trees is bad, but here's a nice little earlier successional area where everything from garter snakes to racers to box turtles can bask here and then head back into the woods if they want or find, find those toads or, um, or grasshoppers, say for a green snake that they might like. Things that people might think, oh, clean that up, right? This old mossy log. You go out in the woods, you go, oh, yeah, I gotta flip that over. I gotta see who's living under there, right? That's habitat, not only for herbs, but for things herbs eat. If you can leave those things around, get your neighbors to leave those things around. Just a nice little wet spot, you know, making sure that doesn't get filled in by somebody. You know, how many amphibians will breed in there? You know, how many ribbon snakes will live in this, this little wet spot? Um, those of you who are seriously rabid, and some of you may be, th these, there are lots of designs. I have no idea how well these things work. Um, the, the little source citation getting cut off down there. But the, there are people um, right now who are building artificial hibernacula. Um, there are a lot of agencies and biologists who are realizing these key habitat components, they're trying to build them on the protected land because where they naturally occur, they, they couldn't protect them. Um, so this was associated, I think, with a pine snake project in New Jersey. Hey, it could, might help the, you know, the, the garter snakes and the brown snakes in your backyard too, if you're, if you're that crazy. Um, contact your legislators. Send them an email. Better yet, send them a card. Send them something you've handwritten that says, hey, I really expect you to support environmental laws, particularly the Massachusetts Endangered Species Act. Believe it or not, they listened because they said, if this one guy sent me a letter, how many other people who don't send me letters um, are going to, uh, who feel the same way as this guy? Uh, contact them. I mean, if we don't make noise, we can't, we can't, um, we can't expect them to know. A couple years ago, a few years ago, uh, my girlfriend and I did a, a, a mini vacation. We went to Western Mass, stayed a bunch of, oh, we want to go hiking here, we want to go to this museum, and we just stayed a bunch of places. And we said, oh, next year, we said, well, let's go to Maine. We went to Arcadia National Park. I thought to myself, hmm, I sent a little email to 
uh, to a chamber of commerce out west and said, hey, by the way, we were going to come back here, but since the business community here had such a backlash against the Rattlesnake Project, we do not want to spend our money in your area. I had a response in one hour. Say, oh, well, I'm sorry, it wasn't us, it was only a few, I don't care who it was. This is what your community decided, I do not want to help those people have successful businesses because they did not protect my wildlife heritage. And I think if more people send emails like that, um, we might see something different. Learn about it. I don't have to tell you folks this, you guys do this for fun. Uh, you know, learn about your, your uh, local wildlife. Here's a, a really cheap reference you can get from our state. Um, carry a camera with you, which we all have on our phones now. Carry a little notebook. These little write and arrange used to be like, you know, specialty supply houses. You can get them on uh, Amazon now. The little ones, just a few bucks and they last for a long time. And then, then send in your, your, um, your observations. We can't protect if we don't know it's there. And don't assume that, well, it's just a bullfrog. It's just a this. You know, ask anybody what the, what the ringneck population in the state is, or what the painted turtle population is, or what the fowler's toad population is. And it's going to come down to, we don't have enough money to properly monitor and protect the rare species. We certainly don't have the funds and time to protect or even investigate the things that we think are common because we, as a society, don't choose to fund wildlife until it's a problem. And most importantly, right, get the kids out there. And you guys do this. There was a little kid here earlier today playing with stuff. You know, give him a snake. Let him see that the snake is not going to hurt him. It's not going to bother him. Uh, it's a bird, it's just an animal. The poor snake probably was much more frightened than him. Um, but my niece and nephew are not afraid of snakes. And that's about all I have time for. Go Patriots. <laughs>